Chris and Chris Talk Movies. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Chris Ferry and of course this is my co-host. My name is Chris Huddleston. And today we are both very excited to be talking to you about the 1990 Coen Brothers gangster film, Miller's Crossing. From the makers of Blood Simple and Raising Arizona, a world where nothing is what it seems to be. Leo, is he still the boss? The day I back down from a fight, Casper's welcome to the rackets, this town and my place at the table. Casper, can he muscle in? I'm sick of taking a strap from you, Leo. And I'm sick of a high hat! Tom, would he sell out a friend? You shouldn't be confronting Jenny Casper. That's what I've been trying to tell you. I can still trade body blows with any man in this town. Except you, Tom. And Verna. Verna? Is she Leo's girl? What did you tell Leo? I told him you were a tramp and he should dump you. I want everybody to be friends. You, me, Leo, the Dane. You know who I am? The Dane. Has he got it figured? You dumping Leo for the guy who put a bullet in your brother? Bernie, will he turn the tables? Don't smart me. I want to watch you squirm. I want to see you sweat a little. All you got to do to show your friend is give me Bernie Burn Bum. Tommy, you can't do this. You don't bump guys. It's not right, Tom. I can't do it. Two of us have faced worse odds. Never without reason. I thought you said you didn't care about Leo. I said we were through. It's not the same thing. I'm talking about friendship. I'm talking about character. I'm talking about ethics. Albert Finney, Gabriel Byrne. Marsha Gay Harden, John Turturro. I can't die. I'm in the woods. I can't die, animal. I can't die. He's still alive. You expect me to believe you? It's you all over town. Alive and no heart. No one is what they seem to be. Up is down. Black is white at Miller's Crossing. Do you have a synopsis for us, Mr. Huddleston? I do. I have a, a brief one from IMDb. And as you said, it's a 1990 film directed, written and directed by the Coen brothers. And it stars Gabriel Byrne, Albert Finney, John Turturro, Marcia Gay Harden, John Polito. And the synopsis is... As such, Tom Regan, an advisor to a Prohibition-era crime boss, tries to keep the peace between warring mobs, but gets caught in divided loyalties. Yes, sir. Now, um, folks, uh, we spoil these films. I know it's a 1990 film, so if you haven't seen it yet, then fair game. But we, we are going to talk all about it. I want to try something new. I want to get our handle up here. We're Chris and Chris talk movies at gmail.com. Like, and subscribe and do all that good stuff. You know, the deal, it helps us. Um, we love to hear your feedback. We love suggestions. If we miss something, um, which we frequently do, <laughs> we're not, we're not, um, you know, professional critics or we're not we're just film, film historians. Right. And, and we like what we like and we read things and we mention them and we talk about it and it's very free form. So, um, you know, disclaimer stated. That being said, I've seen this many times. This is one of my personal all-time favorite films. Um, I do think it's been largely under the radar. Like, I don't think a lot of people know the Coen Brothers, but don't even know this film exists. You had never seen it? I had never seen it, and I'm a big Coen Brothers fan, but I had, this was always, it was always on my list. You know, it was in the back of my mind, but I'd never seen it. Um, and how we got, what got us talking about this was one of my favorite TikToks or TikTok channels or whatever you call it is, uh, Jason Pargan, who is the author of John dies at the end and a bunch of other books. He has a great TikTok. Um, and he was saying how this is, a 
and he, he's he is not to get on, off on a tangent, but his TikTok is really great because he's this guy like around our age who is almost an accidental TikToker. He just started, you know, making TikToks and he was very surprised that younger people are interested in things that he has to say. And at times he will talk about movies like this where he said basically he thinks it's a masterpiece and it's just a movie. It's almost almost in a way like a forgotten film that you know he i think he kind of wanted to bring people's attention to it but yeah it is a gangster movie. and that's what you you forwarded to me and and the thing you sent me um is a terrific little synopsis of this film and and why is certainly he thinks it's special i agree with a lot of what he says um and he's got insightful ways of looking at stuff too that i thought oh that's right on the money and then you were like, have you ever seen this? And I said, yeah, it's one of my all-time favorites. Presuming that everybody I knew also felt that way. And you're like, oh, I've been meaning to. I'm like, oh, you haven't seen it. We got to do it. <laughs> so, yeah, really, really psyched to be talking about this today. But as the as the newcomer to it, you go. What did you think? Um, so, and I've talked about, we've talked about this on the show, that I have never been a huge fan of mob movies and shows like the um the, the sopranos and the scorsese movies and all that casino because, yeah casino and there's and goodfellas and all that because it's it's a i know it's a contradiction because i love horror movies but the violence of mobster mafia gangster things has always bothered me i think just because of the realism of it this being a Coen Brothers movie, and I read a good a good bit about this after watching it, it's much more stylized than there's there's certainly violence in this. Yes. But it's there's a lot more of a it's almost graceful in a way. And and some and it's this is not a a straight up comedy like a um Oh, brother, where art thou? Or uh, the Big Lebowski, or some of the other, you know, really well-known Coen Brothers movies. This is a drama, but there's funny things in it. And one of the things that I, it's the one of the things that made me laugh a lot in this. I feel like this movie is presenting a lot of the absurdity and ludicrousness. I don't know if ludicrousness is is a is a word of what these guys lives are i mean when you really think about it organized crime is is kind of ridiculous yep. and the like there's one scene where he he's going to get roughed up by so there's leo who's albert finney who's this guy that he works for and then there's casper who are sort of these rival and and uh leo is Irish American and Casper is Italian American and Gabriel Byrne is Tom and he's the main character. And so there's a scene where Casper's guys are going to rough him up and there's a big, I, I can't think of the actor's name, but there's a big guy who's sort of like, you know, his muscle Eddie and Dane he's going to, is the character's name. What's that? A, the character's name is Eddie Dane. The Dane okay. they call him. He's a, uh, he's a well, huge no, guy. this is this is the other guy where he's. It's in the scene where he's going to rough. They have him in a warehouse or something, oh, and they're yeah. going to rough Tom okay. up. There's a little guy and the big guy. Yeah. yeah, the little guy and the big guy. And before the guy hits him, Tom picks up a chair and hits the guy across the face, and you know, kind of looks like maybe breaks his nose, and he looks kind of surprised, and he's just sort of like. Jesus, Tom, and he just kind of runs away. <laughs> and another guy he goes comes out and in. Gets and, the little guy. Yeah, the, the, the little, little guy, guy comes, comes in. in. Yeah. So I just thought that was really. There's really a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of humanity in this, and there's even there's a there's also so there's a, a running thing with a uh, he owes money to this bookie named Lazar, and there's a scene in the end where the L Lazar's guys go to. Uh, you know they're punching him in the stomach and everything because he owes this money. And the and the the one guy says, uh, you know, he really likes you, Tom. You know, he and he made sure that we didn't bro break any bones. He, he you said know? we didn't have to break nothing. Yeah, and and Tom's like, well, you know, there's no hard feelings, you know. And and it's just and uh, with Casper, he's all 
he's all he's talking more than one time about ethics that you know you have to follow these ethics and like these are people who you know steal money from people and they kill people and all this and they're worried about yeah. ethics he but, says you know if you can't trust a fix like he fixes fights yeah. he's like if you can't trust a fix what can you trust yeah <laughs> you know? like, and i like that you know the this is a running theme through the coen brothers uh filmography is you know, kind of dumb criminals. They're not as silly in this as, as they are in the other movies, right. but it, I think it's really funny where there's different scenes in the movie where something will happen. Tom is in a place and then the, all the Irish cops come in to bust the place, you know? And he's, so it's just sort of this funny thing where he's kind of working all the sides of everything. He's smarter than everybody else. So he's able to, you know, do this really convoluted, you know, con basically on a, on a bunch of people. So I'm kind of rambling, but two things that I wanted to say is there are two scenes in this that I had probably, I had probably seen clips of this before watching the movie, but that are pretty much instantly iconic. There's a scene where, um, uh, where Tom is, goes into the woods and is supposed to kill, uh, John Turturro's character, who's named Bernie, and Bernie's this kind of this Weasley guy, and uh, and Tom lets him go, and just the way that's shot, I loved. And the in one article that I read, the Coen Brothers said that Gabriel Byrne asked what their motivation was for doing the movie, and he said he couldn't remember which one it was, if it was Ethan or Joel, but they said. We just always thought it would be great to do to take mobsters and put them in the woods. And that was kind of the, you know, the genesis of like their I was just like you never see uh, mobsters in the woods. They're always in the city. And so which I thought that was interesting. And there's a I mean, that's a really iconic scene. And then probably the standout scene of the whole movie is when uh, these guys come to kill Leo in his house and he's listening to Danny Boy. And he and that's Albert Finney, and he has a Tommy gun and takes and I mean that scene is just amazing. I was reading about that, and they were saying how this is where you get into the you know this is it's a it's a real life movie, but it's also a fantasy because they were saying he fires more than a than five hundred shots, and they said if this were real life, he would have had to reload it like six times, but he doesn't yeah. you know, right. and that's just i I really like how they play with this. You know, it's you're you never know. They shot it in New Orleans, but you never know what city they never tell you. Um, I don't know. I'm rambling, but I just I I loved that scene with Albert Finney. I mean, that's just incredible the way that's shot. Um, if you needed evidence that Albert Finney is a great actor on film. You know, if you watch this carefully, he's so good. That he just makes it look so easy, and you take his character so at face value and so for granted, he just makes this whole thing look effortless. But if you really watch him, he's he's just a master. Like, he just understands this world they're trying to create. And one of the things I love about this movie is precisely what you just mentioned— it's not the untouchables. It's not fixed in time about real people in a set place in Chicago in the 20s. You know what I mean? It, mm -hmm. This is a, in the TikTok, one of the things he says is it's almost as if it's in one of these multiverse alternate realities. And there's shots, as you would expect in a gangster film, where someone opens up the newspaper and is reading the headlines. And noticeably missing is the Chicago Tribune. It's like the Daily Tribune or something like that. There's no nothing that anchors it in a specific time, place, or date. And the lingo that they use, like the dialogue is wonderful and succulent. It's like a Werther's. Uh, laws and it's just delicious. Every and that's all of the Coen brothers. You it's know, almost, almost poetry. Everything. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 it feels so specific and so true to this time and place, but not any specific 
right? Like a linguist wouldn't be like, well, that's a Chicago phrase. And, you know, well, it's, and what Jason Pargan said in the TikTok is that they made up their own slang for this. Yeah. So there's a lot of these terms that, that, that sound yeah. like things that you, you would guess prob- people probably would have said in the 1930s, but it's made up some of it. And it, it fits to a T, like the cars that they drive and the styles that they wear feel very much like our universe and the, you know, the hair and the, and the, the machine gun. He refers to the old man, still an artist with a Thompson, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's not trying to be otherworldly. It's just trying not to present. It's, it's like a poem. It's not trying to present itself as historical. It's a kind of a fairy tale of this genre. And that's one of the things I love about it. The other thing I love about it is, um, is the look of it like it's just gorgeous and i again i'm going to steal from this tiktok a lot because i think it's so concise in many many ways but he said every scene in this movie would be the best scene in most other movies Mm -hmm. you know and you say oh the signature thing is the danny boy sequence where they come to whack him absolutely that is a contender but John Turturro begging for his life in the woods is, yeah, exactly. is the one from the poster because it's literally yeah. at the location Miller's Crossing. And I think that's that moment in the film is probably the Oscar nod performance. As great as Albert Finney is, Albert Finney becomes part of the fabric of the film, whereas John Turturro is this wonderful character standout in it you know and has these moments of this ludicrous dialogue and you know i I think that there's you could go through i think when the kid and the dog find rug daniels and And steal it take his toupee yeah that's one of my favorite scenes instead of a kid with his head cocked and they cut to the dog and the dog's got his head cocked then the dead guy who slumped against the wall with his head cocked and his hair skew and it just keeps going around until Uh they sneak up and look and run away yeah, and nobody that's talks. Great. And it's yeah. like, what happened to Rug Daniels? And who's Rug Daniels? And then you see the dead guy, and you're like, there's got to be Rug Daniels. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the rug guy. It's, it's just delicious, the whole thing. And it is funny. I, I own it. And in the extras, they have interviews with Barry Sonnenfeld. That's what I was going to say. He's of, the cinematographer. Yeah. And and so so the Coen Brothers filmography is basically – at least when it starts, is Blood Simple, which we should we should probably. You know, I've Blood never Simple. I've never seen Blood Simple either. As okay, big a Coen so Brothers fan as we, I am, we, we I've always Blood wanted Simple. to see it. Um, you know, it's their first film, so it's it's a little bit less. I think they find their sea legs and and clarify, bring into focus what their brand is. But it's Blood Simple, Raising Arizona as their second movie, also shot with Barry Sonnenfeld, and then this is their third film. Right. And Raising Arizona, we should do that, too, if you haven't seen that in a while. It's been a while. Barry Sonnenfeld I mean, I've was seen doing, it a million times, but he's got this philosophy in an interview uh, all, that's also in the extra features of this, where he talks about he loves to shoot with a he, he shoots with a, a short lens camera. Uh, he, he shoots with a camera w- with a short lens. And in because um, it's funny, he says to. T- Short lens is funny, wide lens is handsome, right? Mm. And he said one of the things we talked about, the Coens and I, was like, this is going to be a handsome film about men in hats, (laughs) right? (laughs) Because he said, I had never really shot with a wide lens before where you see the whole depth of field. And it was going to be Miller's Crossing. We were going to shoot in the woods. We had this location. That was we had like nine days in that location to shoot all the stuff in the woods. And he's like, it's got to be overcast. Like if we shoot, this location is great, but if it's sunny and it's throwing shadows and the light's doing that, this doesn't work. It has to be overcast. Of course, it's too big. You can't tent that environment. You can, Mm -hmm. you know? And he said, we got there, we shot for nine days and it was misty and cloudy the entire time just by chance. Mm. And Yeah, in New uh, Orleans, you wouldn't think, you know. Only on the very last day did the sun start to break through the clouds. And they actually, in the, in the sort of extras, they show this. It's like there's one shot where after he throws up and he falls down, Tom sort of, you know, is on the ground and is kind of coming to. And in the background, you can s- sort of see the sunlight 
playing mm. on the thing, but he's like, over nine days, we just, I had the perfect light in that. He's like, it just would not have worked. Hmm. The sunny forest, it, like it doesn't work as this kind of liminal space, the crossroads of life and death where the mobsters, you know, take each other to, to whack each other. Um, but I, I, I love thinking about the cinematography, especially in films like this and Raising Arizona, because it's so much of the universe of the film and it's so you feel it so deliberately uh it's a little bit like the godfather which i think is another great gangster movie um the godfather is a lot of people's favorite film because it is so gorgeous yes the mm -hmm. soundtrack is incredible the performances are great the writing is great the cinematography is it's it's beautiful and i think that that is true in this film too you can enjoy it just looking at it. You could watch it with the sound off. I think you're missing an enormous amount of the delight of this film, but you could watch it with the sound off and it would just be this beautiful, beautiful pageant of shots. Um, and then, of course, Barry Sonnenfeld went on to do great things. Like, But, but he really started with the Coens, and I think that people think, oh, the Coen brothers are Coen brothers, and you forget the association with Barry Sonnenfeld that is so seminal in the look and feel of especially these early films he said um, on this movie he would never let them pan he didn't want them to ever which it sounded like that was something that they wanted to do but he was like no no panning yeah which i thought was interesting um yeah i i and i think they went on to work with many of certainly torturo again and again and again and oh uh, i don't know i I get the They never violence. worked with Gabriel Byrne again, did they? He wasn't um, ever in any of the other movies, was he? Yeah, I don't think so. I think Gabriel Byrne was a little bit more of a... Uh, maybe an established deal at that time. Maybe they just didn't feel like they had quite the right... You know, I think he does a great job in this movie, and I can't unsee him as Tom... But he doesn't steal the film. It's these other character actors all around him. I mean, he's just like the straight man, basically, you know? Yeah. And he gets the great lines, you know, sister, when I've raised hell, you'll know it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think he reads, and he's certainly an able actor. But, you know, in a scene with him and Albert Finney, you just can't take your eyes off Albert Finney. You know, in a scene with him and John Turturro, you can't take your eyes off of Turturro. Mm -hmm. he's, he's the straight man to the fault of his own... I don't know how much of that is. It's not a criticism. It's just that he is the he's the cipher, yeah, of this you, of this film. You know, there's another director who uh, has a cameo in this. I don't know if you if you caught that or not, but uh, the scene where um, it's uh, I don't I don't know exactly what the place is. It's called something Aaron's, and the police are there and they throw an explosive in in the you know, the place blows up and sure. then a guy comes out and one of the Waving cops shoots him. Handkerchief, yeah. Um, and that cop, that guy that shoots him is uh, Sam Raimi. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. No uh, kidding. Which he was in, they were friends and, you know, I, th I think they were kind of in the, a little, I don't know, cabal is the right term, but they were <laughs> filmmakers who worked, you know, worked together. I, I think he might have produced some of their, some of the early films maybe, but, but yeah. So yeah, he's got a 30 second or so cameo. I was, so was uh, looking neat. up their film. So, uh, the Hudsucker proxy, they wrote with Sam I love Raimi. That I see that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I don't you know, another that I have not seen and I noticed they, when at the end, another scene that was really iconic, I thought is, is when, uh, Bernie kills Casper. Yeah. And I don't know if you noticed or not, but the um the building is it says Barton something or other. And then you know they went on to do Barton Fink, which I've never seen Barton Fink. It's I've seen bits and pieces of it, but I've never You've seen You've never seen Barton I'm not, Fink. I've not seen Barton Fink. And it's like I'm saying you what call a big yourself a Coen Brothers fan. Exactly. I call myself a Coen Brothers fan. Yeah. Like I love the Beatles, but I somebody said there's never a song called Let It Be. I've yeah. never heard that and I I mean yeah. I think These are the great films. I think those. So I've now seen Miller's Crossing, but I've not seen uh, 
I've not seen Barton Fink or Blood Simple, but I've seen I've seen all the other ones. I, th- I think I've seen everything else. But well, you um, you're, you got to watch. We got to watch those. Like if you've seen the Lady Killers, you you got to watch. And Barton the Lady Fink. Killers, I know is is they're not. They can't all be the greatest. Films. Yeah, is lesser. But even it's not terrible. I mean, I don't know that that they've done a terrible movie. You know, um, I like their I like their general look and feel. There's a lot of Hail Caesar that I really like, but I don't know. I like Hail Caesar a lot. Yeah, that whole movie rises to you know the top three of the ones they've done. But there's a lot in that that I just think is wonderful. Um, yeah, absolutely. And you know, we did Buster Scruggs, which I go back to every holiday season. I watch that almost like it's you know, yeah, um, a Christmas story. I, I don't know why. I just. I just love that collection of shorts. They're really good. So, I mean, yeah, I, 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 we can, we can just go through it and be like, remember that part? Uh, That was cool. But yeah, I I think I'm glad that you liked it. I was sure that you would. Rachel doesn't like the violence. I think Rachel, the problem with Rachel and the Coen brothers is she loves the, the vibe, but they do. There is that ribbon of, really acute violence throughout you know and i think the the character of caspar casper um is a good example personified of how they take comedy right he's a clownish character with that little mustache and the sun and and the way he's talking about ethics ethics so you see what i'm saying you know mm-hmm. and he's like um but then he's got like when his anger when he tips he's sort of psychotic right it never spills over to me as like a joe pesci in you know goodfellas or something like that where just at any second you're just waiting for that guy to snap and smash somebody's head in you know i mean no, he's, again i th- he's mostly but but he's mostly a comic character, but they always establish that people like the Dane, like he is a serious player in this ecosystem. Yeah. And uh, Tom even says it. He's like, you know, you can't keep treating Casper like this. Like he's too big for that. You know, he's mm-hmm. he's gotten very strong and you need to take it seriously. And I mean, of course, that turn, Tom turns out to be right. But we see, like in the Danny Boy sequence, we see how um, the Albert Finney's character has gotten to be the head of a crime family. Why all these people follow him devotedly? Because he is he is a capital B, capital A badass. Like mm-hmm. they sent a bunch of guys to kill him, and he snuffs them all. With the you know, but you know, even with that, and this is where I get into the thing of I I talk about there's a kind of a grace and almost a heart to this is they have these scenes with him. He is this badass, but they have these scenes with him and Tom. And I don't know if it's like he looks at Tom as a son figure, but there are scenes in this where his feelings are hurt, you know? And it's just like, it's, it's, it's funny with this, you know, again, it's wonderful. Yeah. All to, to, to be, you'd have to be a psychotic person to live this kind of a life. But he, there's a couple of scenes where he's and at the very end, when it's the funeral of, uh, Bernie and it's Tom and, um, and Leo standing there and Leo tells him that he wants him to come back and work for him. And I forget the wording exactly of what Tom, but he's like, yeah, I don't want to do that. And Albert Finney just looks at him for a long time and almost like you think he's going to cry. And I just thought that was really interesting that it's just, yeah. he's, you know, he's, he's not nearly as it, no one in the film is as smart as what Tom is. And, you know, it's it's almost like you can see Leo kind of the wheels turning. But again, he's genuinely hurt that that Tom doesn't want to, you know, come back to work for him. And I, I don't know. I just think that that was just really interesting to me that they yeah. that they gave 
this sort of more twist of humanity to these to these people. The relationships are very complex and moment to moment they're very clear. So we never really and people don't really talk about their feelings. So the Marsha Gay Harding character um, you know, she and Tom have a romance. She's trying to protect her her brother, the John Turturro character, who is a consummate screw up. Like he's always going to get himself into trouble. He can't help it. Um, and he and also so, probably is psychotic. Yeah, and but so she's got a relationship with the Albert Finney character, very clearly to protect her brother. Mm. And Tom tells him this. You know, she's a grifter. Yeah, uh, and ultimately admits that. He has been having a relationship. Well, he, he comes over one night looking for her. Another great scene. She's in the bed in the other room. And he never loses his cool, right? Nobody ever loses their cool, or very few times do people. When somebody loses their cool in this movie, it's a notable moment. Mm -hmm. And and it happens sort of again. It's a running theme of like where, where these characters break. And they're all remarkable in their ability to keep poker face um, under stress. Yeah, so um, there's all these kind of love triangles and cross relationship things. It's a period piece, so there's lots of kind of, um, you know, uh, racial slang, like they call, oh, he's an Ital and a Guinea and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the Shmada. And they've got, so they're just throwing that around. Um, and yet it's almost affectionate. It's like they're all on the same sports team. Like nobody seems to really. Yeah, these are the these are the these are the categories that divide us and define us. But their relationship, person to person, is always personal, mm -hmm. right? It's you don't ever see people, you know, um, committing something against somebody else purely on that basis. They kind of hold it up as a, you know, like a a superficial difference. Do you know? Do you know what I'm getting yeah, at? Yeah, it's exactly. Like, there's no real teeth to it. It's there and it's acknowledged and it's part of the fabric of their world in this, but in homosexuality too. So you have these characters that sort of what you would think of uh, as unlikely uh, pairings, but even that is just kind of accepted. Like, I know, I know Mink is Eddie's boy and it's, he's very clear on what he's talking about. He understands they're not just chums, right? Mm -hmm. He understands that they're lovers and it's kind of not talked about. And they might have feelings about it, but that doesn't keep him from Eddie Dane being his right hand guy. You know, he mm -hmm. trusts him. So it's like, I love the complexity of it. I love how real all of that feels. And yet it's not a movie that tries to avoid. It doesn't try to whitewash a period that it's portraying overtly. I mean, you could say that that is a kind of whitewashing, actually, that at the time, People did kill each other for racial and social mm -hmm. and se sexual differences, you know. Um, so in the, in a way, that's not the movie this is. People killing each other for business reasons and personal reasons. Um, but the business not... reasons. One article that I read said it's almost like these are rival corporations. Yes. You know? Yes. Yes, and and these bosses are sort of the CEOs of these rival corporations, and. Because you've got Tom going back and forth, you know, to work for and, different And Tom companies, constantly basically. saying, like, this doesn't make any sense. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, why are you defending? Why are you defending Bernie? It doesn't gain us anything. You know, you're just sticking your neck out for this guy because you have a soft spot for his sister. Right. And that's the only reason she's she goes with you is to protect her brother. And he's like, ah, I think I'm going to marry her, Tom. Isn't that a great scene yeah. where he's like, I know you don't yeah. approve of it. But he's like this old tough guy that just murdered all these people with a machine gun who came broke in his house. is a softie and he's like, oh, gee, I just really love <laughs> you know? Ultimately, he's a schmuck and when it comes to her. To love. You know? He's got yeah. a soft spot. But you're right. The relationship between him and Tom is certainly father-son. It's almost like big brother, younger brother. But there's something else too. Like he really needs Tom's approval. He really mm -hmm. is emotionally connected to Tom and all of that backstory goes untold. We can only guess at it because they don't, they're neither of them are the type of the guy that like waxes um, nostalgic and talks about their relationship and nobody else in the film does either. 
Yeah. And I think that's great. You know, that doesn't hurt the movie. It just leaves you speculating and wondering and wanting more about it. You know, I and I you're just say I want a prequel, except, you know, this movie is a, <laughs> is a gem on a pillow. It's like you yeah. can't. It does everything it wants to do and it does it perfectly. And any additional stuff you'd try to tack onto it would just diminish it, I think. And they just, and I think this is something that movies used to do that is done less. You know, I've, I've talked over and over again about, you know, how annoyed I get with prequels and, and all of that, but they just kind of drop you into this, these, all these already established relationships and it's a little bit jarring at first because you have to, you have to they they're using all this slang. So you have to almost get used to the language, but they just drop you in and then you figure it out, you know, over time. And, and I just think that's great filmmaking. Yeah. yeah. You don't need all the backstory. You just understand that th- these different people have these relationships. You don't have to know yeah. everything about, you know, their childhood and, and all of this, you know, to, to enjoy the movie. One thing that I was thinking when you talked about that, the dialogue is almost poetry. One of the lines that I really like that's repeated throughout the film by Tom, he says it three or four times in the movie is they're talking about there's different times where people be like, Oh, you know me or, you know, and he'll say, nobody knows anybody or no one knows anyone. And I just, that's a very simple, but profound line that, Again, it's like poetry. It's it's repeated throughout the film by him, and I I really loved that. And he's an incredibly self destructive gambler. Yeah. Um, to the point where he almost, you know, he almost gets his legs broken. Um, Lazar and everybody else seems to really like Tom and keep giving him extra chances, but it eventually gets he gets so in the hole. That as connected as he is, he doesn't seem to have a lot of money and he basically gambles away yeah. everything he's got. And people keep offering to sort of square his debts for him. And he refuses because he's like, mm-hmm. you know, I'll settle my own debts. I don't, he, know, he, he knows enough that I don't want to be, you're not that string. I don't want, I don't want to be leashed to you by that. Um, yeah. At the end, where he sort of tricks Bernie into shooting uh, Casper. Um, he rifles through Casper's pockets and he takes out his wallet and a huge wad of money that he uses to settle his debts. So yeah. He will take Casper's money at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Once he's engineered Casper's <laughs> death. Um, but there's something in the, you know, and there's something in this guy's incessant need to gamble the sort of nihilism of it and nobody really knows anybody. And it's all this sort of crapshoot or you just take your best shot and you either get lucky or you don't. That is at the very core of this, this character's engine and it's compelling, you know, because I think in some ways, in some ways it's like this, the, the arc of this movie is the death of this guy's heart or the death of this guy's soul. Because he starts, he is the character who initially lets Bernie go, can't bring himself to kill, right? And then when the Marsha Gay Harding character finds out, that, and she thinks he's killed her brother, and she pulls a gun on him, and she's holding it under her chin, and you can see it, that's another great scene, you can see that she's intent on killing him in this moment, she can't bring herself to do it. Mm-hmm. And he says something to the effect of it's not so easy, is it? Because he couldn't, right? But by the end, you know, when it comes around to it, the second time he doesn't have any trouble putting a bullet right between Bernie's eyes. And what is it that um, he, Bernie's begging for his life, and isn't he? He says, have a heart. And when he shoots, he look shoots him in the forehead. Heart. And he says, look into your heart. heart. And he says, what yeah. heart? Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't have a heart. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's it's quite dark. Um, I and in the in the extras, Turturro is talking about it. And he's like, I didn't realize we weren't making a comedy until I saw it. Like when mm-hmm. we saw it at the premiere, I was surprised at how dark this movie got and the places that it went. Because, and you could certainly see that on paper and in Turturro's scenes, 
it's very Turturro is doing what he does with the Coen brothers time and time again, which is these uh, these wonderfully um, often absurdist character sketches of extreme personalities. And uh, and Bernie's very funny sometimes. Um, That's interesting that he said that, because in this one article that I read this evening, it, it was mainly most of the comments were from Gabriel Byrne. And he said that it was not funny on the page, but it was funny, you know, when they when they did it. Some of the scenes. Well, he doesn't really have you don't. There's not yeah, much he's that not Gabriel really does on there that's funny. But a lot of what Turturro does on screen is funny, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and there's yeah. a couple of other. I think a lot of what Casper does on the scene is funny, and I I love. He's clearly a comedic character. I love that he actually illustrates so much restraint in the face of this. Like it's not he's not a mercurial character that flashes back and forth between rage. Like it's very predictable each time where you see him like mauling and stewing and trying to be reasonable and hey come on guys we're friends here now and till he gets to a breaking point and then he snaps you know and he's this sort of like you know and he's like somebody always puts their hand on his shoulder and he's like yeah <laughs> you know and you have to like calm him down and even that is funny um until if you're, they build if you're a up modern the, movie, he'd be in therapy. Yeah, they 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 build up a lot of times in a lot of their movies. There's flame that they use in that scene, and the oh, just put one in the brain, you know, because <laughs> this is this horrifying thing that they have boxers in the corner screaming, oh, oh, you know, and you're just like, <laughs> oh, if they, I feel like in a lot of their movies, there's at least one scene in which they take us to hell, <laughs> mm -hmm. and you hear the roaring flames and the screaming, and somebody gets murdered in a brutal way and i think that's the scene in this movie in which we find ourselves in hell um yeah and you know i i don't know i i am a big big coen brothers fan in general oh yeah this has always been one of my absolute favorites i i we have said that other movies are for me this is almost a perfect movie i i don't if you were like, what are the scenes that slow down or that lose you or that you want to get up and go to the bathroom? And I'm like, I, I can't think of any. I, it's just one string of I love this scene after another. And sure, I love some of them even more. Some of them are big tentpole scenes like the Danny Boy scene is incredible and the begging for his life in the woods is incredible. Um, and him breaking well, into the women's room where he's having that first, you know, femme fatale, you know devil may care conversation with her and it ends with you know si you think you've raised hell and he says sister when i've raised hell you'll know it yeah that's, that's a, great... a great scene you know the dialogue is like yeah that's what i do you know intimidating helpless women is what i do and she's like well why don't you find one and intimidate her <laughs> <laughs> yeah they do that great, great kind of 1930s you know that they did that was done in so many movies yeah. of that era where yeah. the the men and the women you know yeah have that back and forth. Uh, another thing that I read with Albert Finney, he, um, one of those scenes, and it was probably that scene that he actually, they said he liked New Orleans so much that he stayed, they had actually finished his parts. Uh, his, his work was done and he stayed on in New Orleans for like another few weeks or what week or two or, or something and they actually used him uh, as an extra uh, in a dress, and so he's one of the one of the women in, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. in that scene, which I thought was pretty neat. Yeah. They said he was. I was not familiar with the actor, but he Albert Finney was not the first choice. Really? And they said the mm. the original actor was like forty, and he dropped dead of a heart attack. Like, oh my god! Just before they were. Uh, going to start shooting and they kind of had to scramble to get somebody else and and albert finney was who who they went with but he was sort of like a, a last minute choice which is interesting as it, you know he's so good in this yeah he's so so good it's almost like he had played the role three times before and last minute they were like hey we need somebody he's like sure i'll do it i mean he seems so comfortable on screen 
Uh, it's he just, did a movie. I'm pretty sure that I've always wanted to see. Let me. Let me. I'm going to check this this really quickly to make sure I'm right about this. He did a movie in the early '80s. Um, sorry, I know this is compelling as I'm yeah. looking for this <laughs> on. He did a movie, a movie, movie, movie called Wolfen. Have you ever seen it from 1981? It's mm. a. I think he's a cop in it. It's a werewolf movie, but it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be really. That's one I've, I would love to do sometime because I've always okay. wanted to see it. Um, you know, I don't think it's like real silly. I think it's. But it's, you know, the people that turn into wolves or werewolves or something like that. But I believe he's a cop in it. But All but, right. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I would say for this one, I I definitely strongly recommend it. I I think it's, it's a fantastic movie. Yeah, it's ex- so where do you think it is it your favorite Coen Brothers? I mean, it's they've done so many great movies Boy. that I don't know if I can pick one Coen Brothers as a favorite. I do think that, you know, and Fargo is unbelievable also. People mm-hmm. go nuts over Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And I'm not saying it's a bad movie, but there are little things in it. Like, I, I feel like Clooney in Coen Brothers movies it doesn't jive with He doesn't me. do it for you? Well, I, I'm not saying he does a bad job. I just think he's always kind of hamming it up a little bit. And I see George Clooney, and it looks like George Clooney thinks he's really funny. And, I mean, I think that's it's different than a Turturro or a John Goodman or an Albert Finney. Like, it's just not. But I feel like Clooney feels like, oh, I'm doing it. Look, I'm doing it, too. And I'm like, you're not. <laughs> but, you know, that's just a personal response. Yeah, I, have I to think it, he's so. great with delivery of their lines. I mean, I... Probably it just feels like acting to me, you know. And, yeah. And often when Clooney's doing, and I feel like I feel like he's acting. I'm like, hey, I'm doing a comic bit now, and I'm like, no, you're you're missing it. You know, you got to be the character, not behave like the character. And he gets closer to it in Hail Caesar, actually, because he's playing an actor in he's he's an he's an actor playing an actor who is kind of a jackass. And I'm like, well, that's what it works. not very smart. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. I don't have anything against Clooney. I like George Clooney as an actor. But somehow in the Coen Brothers material, I feel the, I feel the you know, the fabric of it. I, I feel mm-hmm. him doing it. And I'm like, you know, in his best roles, he's acting. And you don't see George Clooney. You see the character. And in the Coen Brothers, I've often seen. I, I see yeah. him. I, see him. But I, I, w- I guess I would say that Miller's Crossing probably is my favorite Coen Brothers movie. I mean, and at there... this point, I've I've only seen this once, whereas, you know, some of my favorites I've seen multiple times. Uh, and I definitely need to go back because, I, I, you know... And I, No Country I, for Old Men is maybe was say, my second. I mean, yeah. that's neck and neck. That's a very different nope. movie. Yeah. That is a that's juggernaut not, that's of a not, movie. It's not funny. I don't no, know that it's there's... so rough that even the comedy in it, you're just kind of like... <laughs> You know what yeah. I mean? It's like it's so harrowing that movie. I I saw a really interesting um you know everything that I see now because of TikTok and Instagram or whatever is all just short clips of things so I never see entire interviews. It's always just these brief interviews, but I saw and this is and I've seen a lot of different examples of this. This is a little bit of a side tangent, but with the actors and writers strike there were, and we've talked about this before, I think, but there were so many actors who said, you know, people think because I'm an actor and I'm in movies and I'm in TV that I'm rich and that's not the case. But I saw it was an interview with Josh Brolin and he said he was paid almost nothing for No Country for Old Men. And he said he was pretty much broke. And he did, I forget what the name of the movie is, but he did a movie, I think it's a mob movie with Denzel Washington. And he said, he was like, you don't understand. He said, I had almost no money. And he said, his agent called him and she said, did you see the email that I sent you? And he said, no. And she said, look at your email. And he looked at it. And he had gotten, I don't know if he got points on the movie or something, but he got a check for $60,000 for this, uh, uh, 
and he said it, it was like that was going to save him. You know, he would be able to get by on that sixty thousand dollars. And he was like telling her, "He's like, oh, sixty thousand. And she goes, "No, look at it again." <laughs> and he said it wasn't sixty thousand dollars; it was six hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> wow. And he said, and I started to cry on the phone with my. Now that he's in the MCU and all that kind of stuff, sure. I'm sure that's all behind him. Sure, but that's well, not now he's that Josh long. Brolin. Ago. You yeah. know, I didn't know who Josh Brolin was before No Country for Old Men. And that's not, I mean, I wasn't, I'm not an industry insider or whatever, but I was like, who's that? And it's like, oh, Josh Brolin, is he related to, um, what's the other Brolin's name? And they're like, oh yeah, it's his son. And you're like, oh, yeah, I can see that. He's great in this, you know? And then that was from then on is like, he's in everything. But you would think like, oh, that guy. And whenever uh, No Country for Old Men came out, you would think like that guy has millions of dollars, right? Yeah, and he was he like, was I didn't have stone yeah. cold. He was just so great. I mean, the camera loves him, and he's a pro. One of my favorite lines from their remake of True Grit is Josh Brolin's, who's playing, you know, a, a mentally. I don't know if he's been kicked in the head by a horse or he was born that way or whatever, but he's not a full deck, and mm -hmm. he's washing something in the river or getting a buck of water and she shows up and she's pointing a gun at him and they're out in the middle of nowhere and she intends to kill him and he looks up and he goes i know you and it's just in that one line you've never heard this character speak before you get this whole picture of this guy mm -hmm. that it's he's not playing with a full deck but he's so he is just he's a completely disorganized psychopath like mm -hmm. he's just a loose cannon. And the other guys leave him in her custody. He's like, no, you don't hurt her. Or we're going to hear about him. Like, oh, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> like you mm -hmm. can't trust this guy to follow instructions or do, you know, this is, this is the, the epitome of what a loose cannon is, you know? Yeah. And I just thought it's a great performance. Um, true, great. Was true grit. True Grit is interesting because that really broke through with mainstream audience. Like my parents love True Grit. The remake. And, yeah. And uh, because they like True Grit so much, I sort of miscalculated and I watched, um, I'd seen it in the movie theater, but I showed them No Country for Old Men. And at the end they were oh. just like, that was weird. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay. I it thought was maybe rough. you guys were, it's a rough, you know, dark movie, but yeah. Well, True it Grit doesn't was have, really... I mean, True Grit has this kind of, you know, frontier up, you know, it's a, it's a tough movie, but it's like, you know, if you've got True Grit, you're going to make it through. And he had True Grit and turns out she's got True Grit. And you're kind of like, well, I guess we're going to be all right. <laughs> you know, and yeah, the whole yeah. country for old man's is like, None of this makes any sense. I mean, it's a nihilistic message. That's what the um, that's what the sheriff character is wrestling with. The whole is like, I don't understand stuff. You know, it used to be you bad guys would do stuff for money, or you know, you you knew why they were doing it, and you'd chase them down, and you'd stop them, and you'd catch them. And nowadays, people are just killing each other for nothing. He's like, it doesn't make any sense. And spoiler alert for people who haven't seen No Country for Old Men, which I think is a masterpiece. Josh Brolin, the protagonist of the movie, dies off screen, like very unceremoniously. Yeah. And about I mean, halfway you know, or, or two thirds of the way through the movie. Yeah. And He's then there's the character we're following. He's the guy yeah. that gets the bag of money and is making a run for it against all odds. And we don't even get to see him killed. No, nope. we just he show just up dies in a hotel in a motel room yeah. where the cartel caught up with him and waxed him in the shower. And yeah. you're like, what? <laughs> I mean, you just, what? I mean, there's another 30, 40 minutes of this movie left. What the hell? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no country is probably my favorite. And, you know, I love, um, I love the big Lebowski. I love, it's always kind of viewed as, I think people view it as lesser Cohen, uh, Cohen big brothers, Lebowski? but Lebowski? No, 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 that wasn't, no, that wasn't what I was going to say. People, people love <laughs> like, big Lebowski. Cause that's another uh, contender. <laughs> yeah. No, what I was going to say is uh burn after reading. I think people oh, yeah, view yeah, yeah, it yeah. As, as, as lesser yeah. Cohen brothers, but I yeah. love it too. It's another great one. And of course, raising Arizona, you know, like, like I say, they, I don't know that they've made a bad movie. Um, no, it's, I mean, it's a little sad that they've split off. And then the, the, the most recent movie that, um, 
I think it's Joel Cohen did that was just in the theaters and didn't do very well. Um, so I don't know, but, but yeah, it's, I'm definitely going to have to revisit this one because I, all the, you know, the, it's a very convoluted, not in a bad way, but, yeah, you know, there's all this double crossing and everything, and I, I definitely need to watch it again to to get all of that. So yeah, well, I, like I say, I own it, but I haven't watched yeah. it in a long time, and I was delighted to come back when you suggested it. I was like, oh goody, yeah. <laughs> it's just so good. I love it. It's on Paramount Plus. If anybody has Paramount Plus, uh, so that's where I watched it. But um, but yeah, it's definitely a thumbs up, for, two thumbs up for, for me. So you haven't seen Blood Simple. We got to watch that at some point. We should probably go back and revisit Raising Arizona because it is also terrific. And it is a very, <laughs> it's more comic than it is. There's dark in it too, but it's more comic than dark. Um, and I think if you've never seen Barton Fink, um, they wrote it. Um, no, no, I'm sorry. That's the Hudsucker Proxy. Um, I like Hudsucker Proxy too. Yeah, I think Barton Fink is is one of their if it's not their top three is probably most people I think would probably say their top three is um, Oh Brother Where Art Thou No Country for Old Ben and um, Big Lebowski in the Big Lebowski, but well Fargo too. I mean Jesus, Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's so much good stuff, but. Martin I think have, is certainly a seminal film of theirs. Yeah, I I watched I have seen some of it and I was in college and it was like a like a Saturday night and I'd had too much to drink, you know. And yeah. that's not a good especially for Coen Brothers, that's probably not a good I um, haven't seen what, it in a long time. It's almost a horror yeah. movie, really. Um Yeah. What I would like to suggest I mean I I'm happy to watch any of those. What I'd like to suggest for next time if you're interested is uh on hulu on march so this is uh um uh, last day of february when we're recording this march 7th poor things hits hulu so yeah i'd love to see that i'd say we should do that next i've and, already seen it i saw it in the theater but i might watch it again for the podcast you know but yeah i i can't wait to talk to you about that one and then dude 2 opens in i know it's tomorrow so are and- you I'm not going to go see the opening night of it, but I would like to go see it in the theater. I, I mean, oh, Denny. Are you Villeneuve. going by yourself, or are you? Know. You want to come up here? We'll go see. I can't. It's a long drive. Um, I don't know. I'll see if there's somebody's interest in going to see it. I just can't wait. I'm so excited. I was reading today. They're expecting it. To, so it wasn't a huge opening for the first one, but they're expecting it was like a forty million dollar opening, and they're they're expecting an eighty million opening for well, they're certainly for leaning into promoting it i mean they're there really seems to be a lot more guns. buzz yeah this time around they're firing all guns and then all the all the critic stuff that they've, they've given sneak see i feel like everybody's seen it but me at this point but uh i've seen lots of yeah lots of uh it's just rave reviews i you mm-hmm. know, nobody's like eh. you know everyone's like it's pretty good i don't like science fiction but this is pretty good <laughs> you know it's about I as sub- bad as it gets and you would have to think that this is the one that he's our favorite guy, Denny Villeneuve, that this kind of propels him into the stratosphere, you know? Um, yeah. Because for those people who haven't caught on yet that this guy is a juggernaut of filmmaking. I mean, yeah. I, the fact that Blade Runner 2049 wasn't a bigger, that's a great movie. Yeah. That, that really disappoints me that they, that they weren't able to do more. There's still, I don't think he's involved with it, but there's still supposed to be a, a Blade Runner TV show coming about at yeah. some point. With yeah. I wanted to ask you really quick before we got off here, I sent you. I know you briefly said something about it, but I sent you the, the Variety article about that they're doing Neuromancer. Yeah. Um, oh, I love that's one so, of my favorite novels. I love that book. Should I read it before? watching it i think it's a great read and it's a short read it's not you know it's not like reading the dune trilogy it's a slim book and you'll gobble it right up and it left me i've read it a few times now it always leaves me wanting more like i always want there to be more act three the the climax Mm. of everything i feel like he really could have spent twice as long and then the sort of final culmination of that book um and and it's super influential right 
Yeah, and there's a couple of little things that are sort of laughable that he got wrong. Um, like he's he's basically a he's a hacker and sort of a petty criminal. And early on, when he meets one of the other principal characters, uh, he has this kind of tube that he's smuggling. He's smuggling stuff, and it's like three gigs of RAM or something like that, of illegal RAM that he's, you know, somebody's going to use in their cyber deck or whatever. And, you know, this was when it was still megabytes of RAM. So when it was written, it was the idea of three gigabytes of RAM was a big, you know, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I read an article else about this sort of virtual reality and it's like still feels prescient. Um, it's really something. I read an article the other day, and I'll get the the numbers. I'm just going from memory, so I'll get the numbers not exactly right on this. But scientists have developed a new uh, DVD or Blu-ray disc that I forget what the storage size was, but it was something like it could hold 20,000 movies or something like that wow. on one disc. Wow. Yeah, like full resolution, you know, like 4K see, or 8K or whatever movies. See on, all eggs on one a basket. Disc. Yeah, <laughs> <That's> like- yeah. <laughs> I bought all these movies on this one thing and then my house burned down. Yeah. Ah, I lost all of my stuff. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, if it's all going to be in one thing, then why is it a removable disc? Just to have it be in the player, carry the player around and plug it in and stuff. Right. I don't know. Why is it media? It should just be the box. Um, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know the two, guys that were quoted in the article that are are doing it uh so i can't compare it to their other work i looked it up and the one guy had done it was not anything that i have seen uh really he he started on fringe which i think maybe i saw an episode or two of that but he also one of one of his bigger things was the the jack ryan show with the guy from the office sure i've never that's that's pretty good i I never watched it like when I heard someone was remaking Dune, I mean, and that's a property that has had a long history of trying to get made and fallen through. It's very ambitious and it's got a fan base and it's very clearly drawn. But this is true of Thomas Gibson stuff like Neuromancer. It's like it's very, very um realized on the page, but somehow translating that on the screen has been problematic mm-hmm. um, or they've made changes like they, they change, you know, stuff that you wish they hadn't changed. And then they don't change stuff that you're just like, well, this realized on the screen, this just looks stupid. It seemed cool. In the Johnny book. mnemonic was based yeah. on one of his stories, right? One of his short yeah. stories. Yeah. And it was really silly. Yeah. It was really silly. Part of that's just execution. I mean, part of that's just mm-hmm. directing and casting ice yeah. in it and blah, 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 blah. But, yeah. um, you know, if Peter Jackson can do the Lord of the Rings and Denny Villeneuve can do Dune, then it's possible to do Neuromancer. It's a much slimmer property. It's very dense. It's kind of, it's cyberpunk, you know, it's, um, uh, I just love it. I, I think you should read the book. I'll buy you the book, read the book. No. Uh, whether yeah, you I, watch the film you know, or not. Yeah. I mean, if it turns out to be like, you know, the ring of power or something, I'd be like, just don't. It's so terrible. Which I just, just read today. Or no, that's Wheel of Time. Wheel of Time is something different, right? Wheel of Time they're doing is a different. Th- but it's a similar third, thing. S- they're doing a third season of that. It's a huge, sprawling, 14-book sci-fi series, fantasy series. That I loved. I finally waited all my way through. Um, but it's a big shaggy dog mess. Um, and the adaptation of it lost me. Mm-hmm. I muddled my way through the first season. And it's just, it's different enough. That, and feels glam enough that it's not anchored in the stuff that I needed. You know, it's like, oh, he now said the they'll do the magic effect. And and like, it's not about the magic effect. It's about the relationships, right? Mm-hmm. That's what the Lord of the Rings got right. It's not that he's not a great wizard because of these cool spells he casts that you make with CGI. It's that he's his relationship with the other characters is what make Gandalf great, you know? Mm-hmm. And that, so I don't know. I, I can't, I'm flabbergasted that the films continue to not get that. 
occasionally they get like Denny Villeneuve, they get the right, or Peter Jackson, they get the right person in place and it works out, you know? Right. And they let, it's it's a great story that makes fantasy, which is a traditionally unaccessible, like fantasy just didn't ever have legs in Hollywood. Nobody ever watches fantasy. And this comes along and smashes all the records because it's, it's a great story and told excellently. And uh, the swords and sorcery people, and I'm one of them, I'm not disparaging them, get all of that too. You know, you get mm-hmm. all the dragons and the swords and the spells and all of that stuff on top yeah. of the the way those characters, the reason you play D&D is like you're feeling it in your heart. So then you'd see it on screen and it's like crawl. And you're just like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's a cool looking thing, but none of this makes any sense and I don't care. Mm. So yeah. I didn't enjoy that very much. Right. But you you have to care about the characters or it's just not going to be an interesting movie. The end. Yeah. And I think that they'll probably make a cool looking neuromancer, but I'm afraid they'll fall into that trap too. They just hollow. won't be able to elevate the, you know, the interpersonal relationships and the, and the personal storytelling of the characters above the very dense sci-fi high concept universe that it exists within. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's timely now because in many ways that property talks about this sort of virtual world. I mean, yes, the internet, but this, you know, um, they don't wear goggles to get into it. They just jack right into their heads, but they have these kind of big Casio keyboards called a deck that they kind of mm-hmm. use to navigate around and do stuff in. So they're sitting in the real world while they're experiencing this virtual life, but society has this rich metaverse that they live in and that's the world we're actively trying to build right now although we'll have to wear goggles for it but if elon musk has his way we'll be able to plug in so it's like we're close to that being science future yeah it seems very timely to me especially if they do something fun with it retro like i'd what i'd really love to see is them do something that's true to the book so it's this kind of alternate reality as envisioned by an 80s futurist that would be cool that doesn't feel tethered to what feels like a possible universe based on the technology you know if it's like the year is 20 you know 13 (laughs) you know we can have a laugh right from the beginning because it doesn't look anything like but they're gonna be like it's the year is 2052 and i'm like so in 20 years this is what la (laughs) is gonna look like right that's the joke of blade runner for me is it's it's like, wow, we really screwed this place up. <laughs> yeah, <fast."> yeah. <laughs> you know, it just rains all the time yeah, in LA. I mean, we ruined this planet in short order. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. Okay, so we're at time. Um, do you know what you want to do next, or do you want to talk about it? Do we you, talked about a lot of different stuff. Yeah. Do you want to do poor things since it comes out in like a week, or is there something sure. else that you want to? No, I'd okay. love to do. I'm. I can't wait to see yeah. that. Okay. So we'll do it, poor at, things for next the, time. At the very least, it'll be an interesting conversation. Yeah. It's a very strange <laughs> movie. Yeah, it looks really, I love that they, and the, that one about the uh, Bigfoot family also looks really. Oh, fun. God, yeah. I love, I love people are like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to make a movie that's completely out of the box. And I'm like, great. I'll love that one's it really high on. So poor things was was high on my list of movies that I wanted to see. And then that Bigfoot one. And then I really want I maybe my most anticipated movie and I forget what the title is, but the one with Kristen Stewart, uh, where it's Kristen Stewart and she's oh, in love yeah. with the bodybuilder yeah, woman. Yeah, 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 and yeah. Ed Harris has a big mullet and Love I, Lies I Bleeding. Really, love Lies Bleeding. That <laughs> looks amazing. It looks great. That um I mean, I don't know if the movie's gonna be a good or not, but that is one hell of a trailer. The trailer I is think fantastic. I watched that trailer and I think I audibly went, Woo! I mean, I was yeah. just like, oh, I gotta, if I could hit play and watch that movie right now. Yeah, that's one I of those where you're like, I yeah. want to see that right now. Why can I just not watch it? Oh, you know? that, that looked like hot stuff, man. Yeah. That just looked so gonzo, great. Oh, and Ed Harris with that mullet. He's so scary. I'm hoping because it's Kristen Stewart, it'll it'll play wide. I suspect it won't because mm. it just looks so indie, but, but yeah. you, you never know. I love how indie it looks, though. Mm-hmm. She's really grown into it, though, hasn't she? I think she got yoked a little bit with Twilight and some of those. She's another. Roles. 
but she's, she's doing another, interesting stuff. Yeah, she's another one of those where she made her money in a you know in a big franchise, franchise and yeah. she's doing other she's doing other interesting things and she's you know i think she's really great what yeah. she's done post twilight yeah so i've never seen twilight yeah. we probably should do that <laughs> yeah that'd be fun to i don't really have any like, hey, we're, for it but it's a we're thing. not the demographic that yeah. would be a drunk cast one just like to watch together <laughs> yeah you know but you know the thing is is like I don't like sitting through a movie I don't like. So if it's really yeah. bad, bad, then I'm just like, why are we doing this? Like, it's yeah, not yeah. Like we're making money doing this. No, we're not enjoying it. You know, him too. You know, he's he's yeah. had a really interesting career. Yeah, he has. You know, I think his latest Batman is is the least. In, he's Batman is the least interesting character in that movie. I went back and watched some of that. They're doing a spinoff of the Penguin. Yeah. Yeah. I would not have known that was who that was in that scene. Yeah, it's wild. Makeup. Um, I don't know, though. Eventually, they're going to get around to having that Joker, and they just keep reinventing Batman. I'm getting, like, well, I've had Batman fatigue for a while now. If they're like, a new take on Batman. I'm like, I don't I don't need to see any more Batman for a while. Like, No, no. You still also have not seen Saltburn, right? No, I haven't. And a number of random other people have been like, you know what you should watch? Yeah, we Saltburn. need to do that one. All right. We need to do that as well. I watched that a couple of months ago. But yeah, it's it's a really interesting movie, too. There's a bunch. There's a bunch of stuff to do. There, there's do, a do, bunch do, of them. Okay. Um, thanks for listening, everybody, and joining us on our wonderful little podcast. We're going to talk about Poor Things, which is brand new, critically acclaimed. Um, you've seen A bunch it. bunch of Oscar nominations. Great. So then some spoilers there, but uh, join us. Take it as an opportunity to watch yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I'd warn you ahead of time, we've got to spoil it because yeah. there's so much to talk about with it. And um, that will be great, and I will look forward to that. And unless you have anything else you want to add? I believe that is it. Then Chris Huddleston and Chris Ferry will... Talk to you all next week. Bye.